Clearly, technology is making an impact on our lives. This week on The Current, we'll be looking at technology and how having it at our fingertips shapes our day-to-day -day routines. Welcome, I'm Aaron Hendel. And I'm Cindy Robinson. We'll start by learning more about how USC engineering students are using their new inventions to help others. Annenberg Media's Rebecca Sai is here to tell us more. There are robots that will vacuum your house, tell you what song is playing, and give you driving directions. While the purpose of many robots is to make our lives easier, I had the chance to sit down with a few USC students who are building robots to promote social change. Take a look. Stop it. Pointing and laughing at people is not appropriate. <laughs> Meet Bandit. But don't mess with him. He's an anti-bullying robot featured at Viterbi's Robot Showcase, and he's designed to speak out against and recognize several motions related to bullying. I really liked uh, the bullying robot because I, I had not heard about that sort of research going on, and so I thought it was a fascinating uh, use of robotics. Bandit is just one of over 60 robots being featured here at an open house at Viterbi. Several of these robots are made for rehabilitation to aid people who are recovering from any type of medical issue. My lab is all about creating robots that help people. It's something that I decided about 12 years ago was an important thing to do. If you're going to build robots, make them do something that helps people. But I mean, really helps people who need help, not just, you know, fetches beers. And helping people is exactly the goal of Elaine Short's team. Then use your right hand to press button two. Their robot works to rehabilitate people who have had a stroke and have had paralysis in the arm. They are reaching to push different buttons on this board, and the idea is to help improve their self-efficacy, which is their um, ability to, or their evaluation of their own sort of potential performance. So it's how well you think you could do at a task. Several school children took part in the open house and were able to take a look at cutting edge robotic technology. If we want to inspire the next generation to go into not just robotics, but engineering in general and STEM topics, we have to show how fun it is and what it's really like. There were all kinds of robots and devices on display, including 3D printers and human-like robots. This right here is the PR2, and it's one of the most popular research robots in the world. It can be used to perform many human tasks, like picking up a can. Many of these robots were created by Viterbi PhD students. Right now, a few of these robots can only grasp objects and make limited movements. But students have big dreams for the future. I'm hoping to get into maybe assisted robots so the robot is able to um, work in the environment to help people, for example, people who are paralyzed. I've always liked math and science and um, this is a way to do science, do computing in a way that's really benefiting uh, society. Viterbi holds the open house each year to get more students interested in STEM studies. For Annenberg Media, I'm Rebecca Sai. In what's known as the gig economy, people can earn extra cash driving for Uber or by renting their extra rooms on Airbnb. But what about someone who doesn't have a car or a room to rent? Well, now there's a new app that lets you rent out your spare time. Line Angel is an app that aims to facilitate transactions and provide peace of mind to those whose time is too valuable to waste. Don't have time to wait? Use the app to hire someone to stand in line for you. Jeanette Wynn came up with the idea while working in the music industry. We were putting on celebrity meet and greets and they were so in demand because, you know, they're huge stars. So I would have a lot of fans try to bribe me. Wynn turned what started out as a joke between friends into a serious business plan. Line Angel is now a two-person team working out of a space shared with several other startups. This is Chris. He's my CTO. Hi, everyone. Let's run through it. I'll show you some of the other companies on our floor. Tell line Angel works by pairing an on-demand line sitter with a customer in need, similar to requesting a ride from Uber. Then the customer can stay in contact with their placeholder through messaging, photos, and GPS tracking. Prior, it was $25 the first hour and $20 after, but we're going to be shifting that price point. And, you know, we may incorporate surge pricing if, the, it's, if it's extremely in demand. But will people really take to it? To find out, I stood in line with sisters Janelle and Corey McKee. They paid men to wait in line because they were grown men who they didn't bums to wait in line overnight. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, they paid homeless people, uh, no. like I think 100 bucks wait in line and then they sold the tickets for probably like six. That was 700. the thing, it's mainly the scalpers. The McKees experience trying to get Taylor Swift tickets is exactly the kind Line Angel aims to streamline and improve, as well as profit from. But there are others in the ecosystem attempting the same. I think that app could be very successful. 
especially here. There's a lot of lines everywhere. There's tons of openings, concerts, sporting events. TaskRabbit, a competing app with a wider range of odd jobs and services, like lawn mowing, is just one established name in the larger gig economy that could eat away at Line Angel's market share. If mastering one skill is better than being a jack-of-all-trades, Line Angel's narrow focus may give them an advantage. But Wynn hasn't ruled out expanding the service. The responsibility as of now as a Line Angel is just to save them time, save the customer time so that they don't have to wait and they can be in two places at once. However, we have gotten requests where they can go through with the transaction, and it's something that we're strongly considering for Phase 2 of Line Angel. If you want to earn some cash in your spare time, or if you just don't have any time to spare, you can sign up to test the app on Line Angel's website. But until the fully functional app launches, we'll still be stuck waiting in line. For Annenberg Media, I'm David Merrill. Apps like Postmates and Uber make our lives easier, but they also give some people the financial stability to pursue their passions. The Current's Helen Flourish spent some time with a pair of artists slash musicians who are using the apps to make their dream jobs a reality. This is Steve Seifert. He's a musician and a painter. I've been into uh, playing music since I was a kid. The art thing came a lot later on. But art and music don't always pay the rent. His solution? I drive every day a little bit. I do it because it's like, I can make money doing it. I have spare time and it, it also uh, keeps me out of trouble. When, I... when he's not on the road, Seifert works from his home studio with his girlfriend, Alex Cuby. You can jump in the water, stay drunk all the time. just finished reading a book that I had gotten about careers for artists. And I had already determined that I wanted to work in animation. My son was a little guy and watched cartoons. And really, I was really drawn to it. And then, just magically, this animation studio had moved in right next to where I lived. I worked for a number of big studios, Warner Brothers, Sony, Phil Roman. Jobs got kind of tight, and budgets were cut, and technology jumped in. And and I, I had a gut feeling that it would be a while until I got another job. That's a story that's all too common in Los Angeles, where nearly two-thirds of the population copes with unpredictable income. According to a study by J.P. Morgan Chase, 63% of L.A. residents weather income changes of 30% or more every month, making L.A. the top city in the country for income volatility. That may be why the gig economy, particularly platforms like Uber and Lyft, is so visible here in L.A. But even after losing her job, QB wasn't quite ready to give up on art. I said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it one last shot to pursue my fine art. It's been about four years, and I've managed to stay afloat. One reason she's been able to do that? Like Seifert, QB drives for Uber, too. It's pretty random. There's variables about, you know, what my time commitments are, if I've got a student, if I've got to get ready for an art show. My priority is, is making a living with my artwork. And so when that account gets rather low, then I'll hit the road more frequently. So next time you take an Uber or a Lyft, ask your driver what they do off the clock. You never know who's behind the wheel. For Annenberg Media, I'm Helen Flourish. We use apps for a lot of things, especially social media. USC alumnus Jake Helfer is here with us to talk about his new book, Elevate Beyond. The book focuses on standing out and discovering your passion. He's here to tell us how we can use social media to do just that. Thanks for coming in here with us on The Current, Jake. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So as we said, the book is called uh, uh, Elevate Beyond. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so Elevate Beyond, what it is, it's a real world guide to standing out in any job market, discovering your passion, and becoming your own person. And so as a, as a recent alum, I'm a year removed from USC, uh, one of the things that I focused on a lot while I was in school was how to stand out and gain an advantage. And so I've put a lot of the principles that I found from going to resume workshops, networking seminars, doing hundreds of informational interviews. And I combine that with the lessons I've learned from professors, CEOs, NFL players, and more. And I've really put that to get together in a great package uh, for, for readers and people that are looking to get in the job market to transition and really you know, elevate themselves beyond. In, in the book, there's one chapter specifically about social media. 
what is so important about it uh, for us as um, soon to be college graduates or graduating into the workforce? What is so important for social media? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, one of the big things that I talk about in the chapter, which is called using social media and storytelling to your advantage, is how important social media is in the hiring process. Now, according to Huffington Post, over 52% of all companies are using social media as the first round of elimination. And it's almost as common as background checks and criminal records and things like that in today's world. And so I really dive in and talk about the best practices that you can use and how you can take your social media and whether you want to change it or improve it. But I talk about a lot of these tips and I reference some great people um, that use social media in a positive light to really dive in and help students uh, prepare themselves so that they can stand out and be a great candidate for the job market. And what are some of those best practices or what are common mistakes that you've seen? Yeah, so some of the best practices are, you know, when you think about it, what kind of photos do you like to see? What kind of photos do other people like to see? And when you do the research and you study about it, some of the best things to post about are your family, what you do professionally. People like to see how you dress up. People like to see what your family's like. If, if you have a close family, that's great. Um, you want to show your interests because it shows that you're more than just your resume. You know, it shows who you are as a person, shows your hobbies. Another great thing to post about is your community service involvement if you're involved with any extracurriculars because it shows that you're passionate and willing to help others. And that's really important and recruiters look for those types of things. Now, in your book as well as uh, your blog and other work that you've done, uh, you often talk about believing yourself. How does that um, show its true colors in something like social media? And how do you talk about that in your book as well? Yeah, so believing in yourself, I believe, is just one of the most important pieces to life. I mean, when you believe in yourself and you have the mindset that you can accomplish anything, you're really able to pursue your passions and follow your dreams. And so in the book and with social media, you have a online personality. And just as if you are in person, you know, mean or unfriendly, people aren't going to want to engage with you. It's the same thing on social media. Even though you can't be seen physically um, or you're not talking except for like videos and stuff like that, you're still putting out your character and putting out your personality. So you really want those to be in sync, especially when it comes to recruiting because recruiters are going to look at your Snapchats or your Instagram or your Twitter profiles and if they see something a lot different than what your resume might say, then they're going to raise some questions and that might you know, cause you to be eliminated from the process, or it might raise questions for in the interview process that you might not necessarily be prepared for or know exactly how to answer. Now, you make this all sound uh, very easy, laying out um, nice, useful steps, and of course, you've been there before. But uh, can you talk a little bit about how difficult it truly is and how someone in a different position who maybe hasn't done that before can make it easier on themselves? Yeah, so building a social media presence takes a lot of work. It takes time. It's a process. But one of the things that I've been taught and that I've learned from some business experts are just start small. And what I mean start small is take a photo of you doing something that you love. You know, we all have our own hobbies. We all have our own interests. We all have our own stories to tell. And we're unique in our own way. So be, be, a, be not afraid to share that with the world. So if you love going to the beach, take a photo with you at the beach, whether it's by yourself or whether it's with friends, because people can relate to that. A lot of people like going to the beach. So if that's something you love to do, share that with people and let them see you for who you really are. And I would just say start small and take one step at a time. All right, Jake, thanks so much again for coming in and uh, sharing your experiences and letting us uh, get a little sneak peek into the book. If you want to learn more about Jake and his book, Elevate Beyond, you can check out jakehelfer.com. While social media can help you in your career, spending too much of your time on apps can cause your phone battery to die quickly. See what two USC students are doing to help. Our generation especially the amount of travel we do, work, uh, play, it's essential that you keep your devices charged. You're always carrying a backpack, so uh, it just makes sense to have the two together.
He's on a hoverboard! Remember in Back to the Future when Marty McFly hopped on that futuristic hovering skateboard? Well, hoverboards are now a reality. The motorized skateboards have been blowing up with teens and millennials, but the hot new gadgets aren't all fun. They've also been causing a safety concern right here on campus. Hoverboards were recently banned from all USC dormitories because of explosion and fire safety concerns. The Consumer Product and Safety Commission has received dozens of reports, but that's not what worries the campus Department of Public Safety. Uh, the only uh, complaints that we've had about hoverboards are collisions. Uh, we have had at least one person uh, receive medical attention due to crashing on their hoverboard. So it's not the combustible issue or the, the explosion of fire. We haven't seen that. I've seen people take some funny falls on hoverboards, but uh, it's not like really any more dangerous than skateboarding or biking. I think hoverboards are beyond dangerous. Jasmine Kianfart learned about hoverboards the hard way. I actually ate pavement really hard riding a hoverboard. Um, I think that's kind of where my hate for hoverboard stems. So the issue is when you have the center of campus between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., a period when we're supposed to have a campus safety zone for pedestrians, it's still loaded with bicyclists and skateboarders. It's really unsafe. So you add in hoverboards and people are just learning to ride them. We at DPS have more concerns about that than any sort of uh, fire-related issue. So I'm hoverboarding my way to class. It's the first time I've ever ridden one of these, and I've been zigging and zagging through all sorts of people. I can totally see how this could be a safety issue. No more of a safety concern than bikes or scooters and stuff. They usually don't travel that fast, so I don't think it's like a big problem. I've never seen, I've seen more bike accidents than I have hoverboard. In the U.S., hoverboards top the list of hottest holiday gifts of 2015. Industry experts estimate that Chinese manufacturers exported $4.6 billion worth of the smart scooters in 2015. But safety concerns prompted major retailers, including Amazon, Target, Walmart, and Toys R Us, to pull hoverboards from their shelves. So now they're hard to find, almost as hard as learning to ride one. From the University of Southern California, and on a hoverboard, I'm Scott Cook with Annenberg Media. Thanks for watching today. Tweet us your thoughts on the show with the hashtag TheCurrentSC. That's it for The Current this semester, but you can continue to stay up to date with stories around USC on uscannenbergmedia.com. And that's it for us. We're done hosting together. I'm graduating. Well, best of luck. Uh, unfortunately, these people are going to be stuck with me for the next two years. But <laughs> Uh, most of the crew is, is moving on. Yeah, Helen and I are gone, but we had fun hosting with you. <laughs> I'll see you guys in the fall.